come and to worship with you. Uh, from my childhood, I've always watched you guys worship. Like, I love your worship, worship because you sing and you dance, right? It's so exciting. I, I tell you that our minor Nepali communities, they also love singing and dancing, right? So it's amazing. A lot of times uh, when people visit uh, to our churches, I say, if, if you come to our church, it looks like totally charismatic, fully charismatic because, you know, they're, they're, they dance and, you know, they sing naturally, right? <laughs> so it's such a great uh, privilege. So it's been really wonderful uh, to know our pastor. Thank you, pastor. Thank you, church, for allowing me to come and share what God has been doing in my life, in the ministries that God has given for me and my family. So as our pastor mentioned, you know, I am from Nepal, actually, born and grew up in Nepal. A conversion from Hinduism to Christianity and came to know the Lord. And only one Hindu kingdom in the world, and Buddha was born in Nepal. It's very much Hindu-Buddhist culture over there. It's illegal to be a Christian over there, anti-conversion law. So you could put, be put in jail anytime and be arrested anytime for following Jesus. It's tough. There are less than 1.5% Christians and underground, but God is doing a great work. And you know, Nepal now has about 6% growth rate, rate of Christians, one of the fastest Christian growing countries in the world. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. So coming from that background and coming from, like, I, I was actually trained to be a Hindu priest because my grandfather was a Hindu priest. But God had a great purpose in my life that, you know, I could join the royal priesthood. Actually, I'm still a priest, right? <laughs> and for the kingdom of God, that's a wonderful thing. And as our brother mentioned, you know, like having, you know, studied in Nepal and serving in Nepal, God has used all the time, used me all the time as a tent maker. And I was a student leading lots of you know, students to the Lord, and I went and worked, and then I led so many people to the Lord and established or planted churches and uh, in Nepal, and then after that in Malaysia, Australia, all these places, and as a tent maker. So it's been a very interesting journey for me to see our Nepali brothers and sisters come to the Lord. Because that's the only hope that we have here on earth and after that as well. So that's, that's been very exciting. Uh, so uh, as our brother mentioned, like when I'm married, I've got two kids. My daughter, she's in Liberty University. Uh, she's graduating uh, this coming year. So, and then my son is a freshman in uh, Duke University in Durham. So they came home last, I think, uh, a night before and they surprised us. They didn't tell us that they were coming. Uh, so they are beautiful children and uh, so praise God for them. So uh, I just want to share this morning a topic. Being and making disciples who make disciples for church growth. You know, that's the topic, right? Being and making disciples who make disciples for church growth. You know, we want to see the kingdom of God grow. You know, if we, if we really narrow down, if we have a local church, we want our local church to grow and to see more souls being saved and their lives being transformed. That's our dream and desire, and also a command that Jesus had given to us, right? So, uh, just to really understand, you know, uh, we need to really go back all the way to Genesis. Is, what was it? What was God's plan and intention? If we read in Genesis, you know, uh, 1, 26 to 28, you know, that's where we can see this whole thing right there, about being, making disciples, or being fruitful, and all of those are mentioned there. God created us, you know, in his own image, right? In his own image. And uh, male and female. And God blessed us, blessed us. And then he asked us to be fruitful, right? 
And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, that's Genesis 1, multiply and fill the earth, and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on earth. So the whole thing is, you know, what God is doing right here in the creation. He created you and me, mankind, in his own image. You know, that he could have fellowship and he could continue to multiply that and for the glory of God and his kingdom. So he had a, he had a desire and a purpose to fill the earth with his people. In all his reigning and ruling, and always glorifying his name. That was his whole purpose, you know, when he made man and woman in his own image. So he wanted us to bear his image, right? And multiply his influence on the earth. So we need to understand as a church, if we want to really grow, that what was the original intention or purpose or design that God had in mind to really create you and me, you know, in the Genesis early times. So when we know that, okay, God wants us to really multiply, to grow, to dominate, and to work with Him, you know, that was right in the beginning. To see that multiplication, to see that growth, to see that fruitfulness. An amazing, amazing purpose. So we need to know, you know, when we know that in the background, why God made us and what was his purpose, we understand the discipleship, right? But that did not last long. You know that you read Genesis 1 and 2 and a wonderful thing, great, you know, you know, hope and design and a purpose and a plan, but that did not last. When we come to Genesis 3, you know, people, you know, did not do or the way God intended, like they didn't become obedient and they turned away from God. They destroyed the whole plan, you know, no more. You know, their relationship with God was gone and their relationship with each other was broken and with the whole creation itself as well. From there on, you know, you know, we know about Jesus, why God had to send his son, right, to this earth, to really restore, to reconcile and restore that relationship with God. So the whole desire, the purpose is to really bring back, you know, us to himself, to reconcile us to himself, to restore that relationship by redeeming us, you know, by the death of Jesus on the cross. So, because of what he did on the cross, we had the opportunity, right, that to be born, to be, be part of the family again. If you see in John 3.3, 3, you know, Jesus tells Nicodemus that no one can see the kingdom of God without being born again, right? So, it has to start with being born. A lot of, I, I kind of tell this to you, because a lot of times we come to church, it's more like a religion and ritual. I mean that I have been going to church, or my mom or dad. So, uh, we, we go to church. We kind of assume perhaps we are born again, perhaps not. So we cannot start this journey, this discipleship journey, if we are not born again. So our pastor had mentioned about this discipleship class, perhaps on Wednesday or something. We talk about it and all of that. We cannot go through that if we are not born again. So it's so important first to understand that we need to be reconciled, we need to be restored, and uh, in the relationship with God. That's the beauty, that's the great thing that God has done for us, and we need to understand that. So that's the rebirth, regeneration. We need to be born again. You know, that's the very central message. That's the gospel. 
what Jesus did on the cross and that allowed us to be born again and come to the kingdom of God to be reconciled with God and start a new life. You know, I, I like your deeper life or whatever the great name of this church. And I was thinking about like, you know, you really meant it. Like, you know, you really want that deeper and that great, beautiful, great life that God has for you and for me. You know, God has that purpose. So, it's so important that we are born again. And if you want your church, you know, or even your own life to really experience the blessing of God, and if you, are, if you want to see the growth in your own spiritual life, or the growth in the church, it's so important that the church makes sure each one of us are born again. It's so important. We cannot start this journey without being born again. And don't take it for granted. A lot of times, as I told you, we could think that, yes, perhaps we are because I've been doing everything they have told us to do. Perhaps rethink it. What does it mean to be born again? You know, to make sure to have that assurance of salvation. Right? It's so important because we, we may be thinking that because we do a lot of things as a rituals and religious activities, we think that we are okay. None of those. Not even going to a Bible study group, coming to church, giving the tithes, offerings, anything. None of that, you know, helps you to be born again. It's nothing. You know, the work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross when he died on the cross, and he reconciled us to God himself. When we understand that fact, and we have that faith to believe on that very fact, and surrender our life, and asking God or our Lord Jesus Christ to be the Lord of our life. The Lord. He has to be the Lord of our life. And, uh, and if he's the Lord, he will lead us. He will guide us, and he will use our life for his glory. All right, number one is that, you know, to be born again. But also, we know that if we go to John 1, 12, you know, it's, it's you know, through faith in Jesus, we have become the children of God, those who received him. So it's our identity. It's our birth, but we need to know who we are. You know, a lot of times... You know, we try to get our identity, you know, from all kinds of things in the world. You know, so that, that, that's a big, big thing or uh, something that we are always looking for. You know, like our identity, we look in our career, where we are born, or our families, our homes, our wealth, and things of the world. All of, all of us, in some ways, crave for that our identity with the things of the world. But here, we are the children of God. Nowhere, nowhere do, I, do we get our identity except in Jesus, in God. Because he's the one who created you and me. All of our fingerprints are different. We are very special. And God knows who we are, why he made us, how he made us. And he only has that plan and purpose for you and for me, right? Therefore, it's so important to know who am I. I'm born, good, that's wonderful, but I need to know that I am the child of God. And the most important thing in our life, right? It's so important thing in our life to understand that and to know that, and then we act out from there, we act out. So our identity, right? And then <clears throat> as we continue, so we need to know, you know, what Jesus did. When Jesus came, G Jesus asked us to follow him, right? To follow him. Jesus says, come and follow me. If we see uh, Matthew 4, 9 and 19, he asks these people, hey, come and follow me. I'll make you the fisher of man. Right? Those fishermen that he, he said, follow me. 
So when he asked them to follow him, so these guys lived with him, ate with him, everything. They you know, saw everything what Jesus was doing. So there was a fellowship, close fellowship, close learning, trying to understand this perfect Jesus, you know, who was the, you know, only perfect person that we could follow, we could learn from, that could please God. So then Jesus kind of showed how he can form, you know, himself in us. You know, that how Jesus can live that life through us as well. That's forming us into his image. The image that was destroyed in Genesis 3, now he's trying to really rebuild it, restore it, right? So that we can again be fruitful, right? So following him and fellowshipping with him and forming that image in us so that we can again be fruitful. The whole idea is that we are trying to go back to Genesis 1 where it started and then, you know, live that life to be fruitful. So, when Jesus came, so this is the great thing, that when Jesus came and he did everything, you know, taught his disciples, you know, the great thing about the, the discipleship is Jesus had like four things in, in modeling this discipleship. Number one, he modeled, you know, he showed how to live a life that pleases God, how to de- live a life that is very fulfilling according to God's will and purpose. And he said all the time, I don't do anything of my own, but of the will of my Father. So it's so important. So he's, he's showing the life that how we should live, right? That's a model. He modeled it for us. He showed it to us. Number two <coughs> is that he, again, when he really you know, showed his disciples, like, okay, now I've taught you, I've showed you, like, you know, he gives them the authority, he gives them the power, and you go and do it, right? You know, he sends them away. And then they begin to really practice those. And Jesus still helps, still supports, gives them the power, gives them the authority, and they go and practice it. Now they are doing it what Jesus was doing, right? And there are, you know, problems and issues like, and hey, you know, uh, sometimes they couldn't heal this guy or that and what happened. So they had to learn a lot. So Jesus is really modeling, is assisting them to do what he did, and then watching, you know, how well they do it. And when he finished his task, like, hey, now in Matthews 28, when he had com- uh, finished his task, now he's giving it to his disciples. And then he, his, he was going to leave, right? It is in Matthews 28. Now that's where, in a great commission, we will be focusing, Ma- Matthews 28, 18 to uh, 20, <laughs> here. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Amen? Amen. So now he's finished, right? <clears throat> he's telling now, like, hey, you know, disciples, you are, you know, you, I am with you all the time. And he said, by this time, it's good that I better go, because when I go, I can send the Holy Spirit, and, you know, we can do more works and win the world and fulfill the, the plan that God had in Genesis right here. So he's ready to leave, Right? So how we are, he's discipling, I mean, he's leaving this great task of great commission to these disciples, you know, they were not very stable, sometimes they were denying, so they fell and they were not, but still, Jesus knew that when he sends the Holy Spirit, then the Holy Spirit will begin to work in them and through them, they will be successful 
and they would really be able to do the task that God has given. So now, the very important thing is that, as I told you, that when we are born again, that's when we get the Holy Spirit, and then we allow the Holy Spirit to really form us into the image of God and to really use all the power and the authority that he has given to us. You know, when a, a child is born, in that child, everything is there, right? Everything is there. But, but that child has to raise. We have to raise that child. You know that, like, you know, how much effort it takes to raise a child. I know that for me too, because you know, raising them until they're 18, even more after that as well, it takes a lot of effort. Raising that child, and recently I became empty nested anyway, <laughs> but they, they come back. <laughs> so raising, raising your children is, discipleship is like raising your children, right? Raising your children. So if that's not in the church, and if the church is not focusing, you know, raising each one of you in the image of God, in the image of Jesus Christ, and in maturing them in that way, the church cannot grow. So we are only looking at the numbers because your life and my life should be the salt and light. That people feel like they're thirsty, they're hungry, they can see themselves, they think that this is the best thing ever. When you become a disciple, you need to know that this is the best thing ever. If you don't know that, you cannot share it. If you don't know it's the best thing, it's the best life, you cannot share it. It's so important for you and for me to know this is the best thing. Like if you read in Hebrews, you know, Jesus is better than everything else, better than everything else, right? And then you and I need to understand Jesus you know, his life was the best thing. And they, that following him, being a Christian, I have the best thing ever. Until unless you are convinced, convicted and convinced of that, you cannot go and share the gospel. You have nothing to share it to, to others. Right? So when you really, when, when we say the discipleship, it's not only a class, right? It's wonderful to have a discipleship class. But it's so important for you and for me to practice it, right? To practice. Discipleship is a way of life. As I told you the, the story, how we raise our children, that's the discipleship. Actually, you know, so somebody like, you know, our pastor said, like, he was, you know, your parents, like, 80, and all of that, they still have their children. They still feel like they are, your, you know, their children. So it never ends. You know, you always will be a child. So discipleship is also like, like raising that child. It's a lifelong process. It continues. But what really is important is that in the discipleship process, you know, you know this morning we were learning about the virtues, right? Our sister was talking about the virtues. And that is the development and manifestation of those virtues. So as I told you earlier, a child is born, every potential is there, but that needs to grow and needs to come out of that person, right? So when you are born again, you are a believer, the Holy Spirit resides in you, and in your, you are new, and everything is right there, ready. You don't need to ask God, come on, do this, do that. No, he's already in you. He's waiting to work through you, my brothers and sisters. You know, you need to be obedient. That's why Jesus says, you have to be obedient. He is there. He is ready. He's waiting to manifest his power, his purpose, his, his works through you. He's waiting for that. And you need to let him work. That's why obedience is important. You know, when Jesus taught his disciples, hey, you've heard, and it's wonderful, you know, in, in Matthew 7, like, okay, you know, if you heard, it's a good thing, but if you did not apply that or obey that, it's like building this house on the sand, meaning all of those was useless. Listen, my brothers and sisters, we come here. Like in America, it's full of 
than a head knowledge. Right? We love a great preacher has got PhD and every Sunday great preaching. We love it. It's wonderful. But then, if we did not obey or practice that, it's like building this, you know, your house on the sand. It's useless. You wasted your time. Everything. The two really have that full picture. And Jesus said, if you went and obeyed and did what God asked you to do or manifested or gave yourself to do the things God asked you to do, then your house is on the rock. You saw that big difference. It's like heaven and hell. It's such a big difference. So the whole purpose of the discipleship is to help you to obey what God has taught you, right? It's so important. So until unless that happens, the church cannot grow because people don't have anything to see in you. You think that you come to church perhaps one, two, three hours on Sunday here and go back in your life is the same like everybody else in the world. They don't see any difference, you know? And they think that, oh, yeah, these guys are Christians. They go to church on Sundays. That's it. Nothing is different. So the church actually starts when you leave this place, you know, you come to celebrate and to learn, to grow, but... When you go out of this church building, the real church starts. You are the church. You are the church in the world. That's why Jesus says, go into the world. Go to the nations. And you are the church going there. You're leaving the church every day from Monday to Saturday. Like Sunday you come here. But Monday to Saturday you are leaving that church. Do you see that? You don't stop. You actually continue to be his witnesses, right? Here, when he sends, like it's, it's, you know, when he made the disciples, did he say that, hey, come and gather here and enjoy and everything? No, he said that go. He sent them away. Go. Therefore, and make disciples of all nations. So they, they were sent as they go. And so, some, some people say that, Hey, better to say this, as they go. It's important. As we go, as we live our lives, you know, you may be students, you may be you know, engineers, doctors, nurses, business people, anybody. That's your place of mission. That's where God has put you. God is sending you over there. You are thinking of a lot of times, hey, are you, this is only for the missionaries. All oh, right, like, you know, I'm not a missionary. I mean, the moment you receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you're born again, you became a missionary. You became a missionary. Not all of us are missionaries in our own workplaces, in the area, in the community where we live, and make an influence and become a witness for Christ. Do you see that? That's where we, we, we were missing so this, this country craves for that. They, are, they want to see that. They want to see the different community. You know, people are craving. Like, you know, when you see the world, it's terrible, horrible, bad, secularism, so many things. But where's our community? Where do we really give them an alternative life? Alternative in a community they can see and join and understand and see the love of God, love of Christ, life of Christ through you and through me. So where we go, you know, housewives, you know, children go when they go to school. All of these are great mission field. <clears throat> As I told you, when I was in engineering college, amazing. And there would be sometimes the people who wanted to serve God and they were trained, they were paid staff. And they would go and try to share the gospel. I mean, our, our, our friends would beat them and kick them out of the college. First, it's illegal, <laughs> you know. And on the other hand, who, who are you? But I was a student right there. I was not paid. I'm a friend with all these friends. And they would oppose me, but I'm, I'm journeying with them. 
Do you see that? And when I'm doing that, when there are problems, there are issues, they would say, Tom, can you pray to your God? I'm going through this problem. And I said, wonderful opportunity. Bring it before God. Their needs, their challenges. And God answers. And they would say that, Tom, I think your God is really true living God. I want to know more about it. And the church I went to was full of engineering students. And it was like engineering church. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. You be the salt. You be the light where God has put you. You know, that's your mission field. When you become a disciple and live a life, and always God gives you an opportunity, you know, so that we can help them. We can, we can support them. We can give them a different life opportunity and styles to them. Do you see that? So you must be convinced, as I told you, of the life that you have given. This is the best life ever. Right? This is the best course. A lot of times people think it's more like religion. Okay, I have to sacrifice this, sacrifice that. You know, a lot of times. And we're afraid. People are afraid. No. You know, a lot of times youths, oh, no, like, okay, if I become a Christian, I cannot do this, I cannot do that. No. Uh, you only cannot do what? That destroys your life. The enemy comes to kill, to destroy, and to steal. That's all you cannot do. But everything, when Jesus said, I came, I came to give you the life, life in full. So that if you want a joy, if you want fun, if you want the real joy in your life, that's in Jesus. There's no better place. I mean, do you really want to know about life? That's where. If you want a better marriage, that's in Jesus. If you want to raise better kids, that's in Jesus. If you want a better community, that's in Jesus. There's love, there's grace, there's mercy, there's kindness. That's the type of life you're living. And that gives the full meaning. The fullness of life. Do you understand? The fullness of life we crave. Don't you know that we all suffer? Like, you know, we have issues in our families, husband and wife, the children and others and the friends. Those relationships are all broken. What is God trying to do? Restore that. Bring the reconciliation. Bring this closeness so that we can enjoy life. Don't you know that? Simply for you who are married, when your relationship with your wife or husband is better, you begin to feel better, more energetic, more fullness. You do that, right? And right there, that's where the discipleship should come. That's where it should begin to transform your life. You know, you come on Sunday so that you can work the rest of the week in your own life. Discipleship should start in your home. In your home. With yourself first. Don't point to others because we all are good at that, right? But it's with you. Transforming your own life, you know, in the image of God, in the image of Jesus Christ. When you become Jesus to your wife, Jesus to your husband, Jesus to your children, you can see the real church in your home. Living the church in your home. Right? That's what people want to see and experience. That's the best thing ever. A lot of times, if you only come on Sunday and, great, and listen to a great in a sermon and wonderful songs, which is good, but didn't go back and practice it, live it out, you missed the whole thing. You still did the religious thing, not the relationship that God desired. Right? So it's so important. Like that's why Jesus says it's, it's in Great Commission. There, you know, the authority now that God has given through Jesus and to us to make disciples and baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, but teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. In some other translation, it said to obey, you know, observe or to obey. Everything that I, I commanded you. A lot of times we limit that to, a, to only a teaching. Wonderful, I learned about God, I grew, I have all the knowledge and everything. But Jesus didn't tell that. He told that teaching them to observe or to obey 
everything that I have commanded you to obey. Until you obey, it does not work. It does not work, my brothers and sisters. It doesn't work. So, now we really need to come out of the tradition. Sometimes, as a church, we build all kinds of traditions. Oh, we feel like we have done this, we have done that. Oh, everything seems good, eh? fine. But that we are further away from the Word of God and the truth of God. So if we did everything else and didn't do this, we are further away. You know, when in Matthew 7, you know, there are people that say, In your name, we cast the devil. We heal the people. And then Jesus say, Further away from me. And you may be wondering, what? I did everything. Right? But what he, he's saying is that it's not because they cast the devil. Right? They healed. It's because they did not obey. If you read the verse before that, because they did not obey, did not do the will of my father. Right? We could do everything. But if we didn't do the will of my, our father, the will of God, we missed the whole thing. That's why it's so important. In the discipleship, you know, when he made disciples, and he sent the disciples to make disciples, what's he doing here? He's saying, teaching them to obey everything that he has commanded, if you want to see that. And you cannot do it alone. A lot of times, you know, it's a good thing. We all know that it's good. We know a lot of good things, right? But we cannot do it on our own. We fail all the time. And that's why Jesus says, no, we know, I know that you cannot do it yourself. That's why he says, he gives that promise that I am with you always to the ends of the world, age. Okay? His presence is there. He said he would do that. And <clears throat> as soon as we go, we, when we go to Acts, like, you know, he's almost ready to ascend to heaven. And again, he repeats that he will send the Holy Spirit, you know, and you will have the power. That's how you live it. You and I cannot live this, but the Holy Spirit through us, can, we can do it, right? And that's why he said that. That's how you will be the witness, that you will be able to you know, witness his works to the ends of the world, starting from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the world. So when he's sending us with the Great Commission to fulfill that, to share the good news to the world, and he's allowing them to, letting them know that you will have the Holy Spirit. And then fast forward, as you see that in, in Acts 2, that in the Holy Spirit comes on them, and then from there on, thousands of people, Come to the Lord. Now, the real thing is happening, right? Real thing is happening. So when you go to, you know, uh, Acts 2 and towards the end, 42 to 47, that's where the first church formation, like the fellowship begins to form in a form, where there's a fellowship, breaking up bread, singing and learning and supporting everything, living that life out. You can see that first, you know, New Testament churches, how they grew. So that, that's all about them. That's their life being transformed. Their behavior, their, their, their life was totally different. And then people loved it. Praise God. And the numbers were, what? Increasing. 3,000, 5,000, and so many. So it's so important for us to understand if we want to see the church grow, that has to be with the discipleship. Starting with you and me first. And that, that should go into our families, into our communities. That's where you know, we can practice, obey, manifest what God wants to show. Right? You have the best. I always tell that and a, lot, a lot of times when leaders or preachers, hey, you come and do the God's work. You have to be a preacher. You have to be a pastor. But I, I tell that, you know, it's not that. God can call you to be a nurse, to be a doctor, to be an engineer, to be a teacher. The thing is that you do best where you are called, and that becomes an instrument to really do the 
work of God. Right? For, for example, for Moses, it was a stick and a staff. And he used that. And for David, you know, this thing or catapult that he used, sling, you know, to do his work. So whatever he's given in your hand, you know, as whatever he's given you as a career, God can use that. You know, when I was an engineer, God used everywhere. Those engineering. So when I went into the villages building bridges and building the roads and buildings, I tried my best to do the best. Because in Nepal, it's a, it's a corrupt country, right? You get a lot of money, put in your pocket, don't build a good project, right? Most of the engineers do that. But the villagers now see that they have the best project and they would ask, engineer, engineer, why do you do this? And I tell, I get an opportunity to tell them why I do this. Great op opportunity for the gospel. The church grows that way. And the church is all of these villages where I, you know, went and did the work for the Lord. So it, it's the... It's the wonderful thing, actually, like because, as I told you earlier, in engineering college, when people go from outside, try to, you know, share the gospel, people don't like it. It's just kind of a religion they come. But if you are a student there, or a teacher, or a professor, you are with them, living the life with them. That's the best mission field. So when you have all these different kinds of professions, you know, opportunities, businesses, or students, whatever, wherever God has put you, that's the best field, right? God wants to use you right there. But in all, in order to be effective, that you need to be a disciple. That has to change. Your life has to change, transform first. And then people can see that in your family, man, I want a family like that, husband like that, wife like that, children like that, community like that. That's how people are drawn to his kingdom. That's how people are drawn to the church. And they see that this is an alternative community. And God's kingdom continually expands. So here's a, an opportunity for you to really commit your life to the Lord again, again and again. That that's the best thing that we can do. To commit our life to ask God, have I been a good disciple? Have I even been born again? Like, have I that encounter? And do I know I'm a child of God? Or do I know and I'm sure and assured of the salvation where it starts? And I'm, I'm perhaps born. Perhaps I definitely know I'm born, I'm saved. But am I growing like that child? If I'm not growing, I'm, if I'm not being discipled, you know, I can't, I know I'm not strong. Right? That child to be strong has to be discipled, raised. But then in that child, as I told you, that everything is in that child to be a person, a man or a woman, that needs to grow and manifest and be used. And the Holy Spirit has come and resided in you. You've got a new life. Are you going and living like that? Trusting God that he will give you the victory in your life the best life you've ever gotten. Just like in Hebrews, Jesus was better than anything else. And your life is better than anything else that you would ever find in the world. That's the best life. And when you are convicted and convinced of this fact, you are able to go and tell your friend. You can get excited to go and tell them. And your life is saved here. Your life is saved for eternity. It's both. Before we go to the other side of the heaven and this side of the heaven, that we can see what God can do. So thank you so much for the opportunity to come and share. I pray that God will bless you, bless your life, and your life is so amazing, so blessed, because that's in Jesus. And hunger for that, thirst for that, there's nowhere else except in Jesus. And he can do it. He will do it. He's done it. He's shown it. And then you'd be the best person ever God dreamed of and you dreamed of for his glory, for your blessing. In the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor. Yeah.
right, let's, let's pray. Let's commit our life. Let's stand up and let's pray and ask God to really bless us. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Lord, we thank you and praise you for this wonderful opportunity to come and share this with your people. Thank you for this church. Lord, I pray, oh God, you'd bless this church. Bless individuals over here. Bless their lives, Lord God. And Lord, we pray, we know that it's an amazing thing that you've made each one of us so different. Our fingerprints are different and you have a purpose for our lives. You want us to experience, to experience the full potential of our life that you have created. And that's, also, that's only possible in Jesus. Lord, we pray to you, Father, for all the members in this church, they would really experience that and really seek for that, thirst for that. You would really bless them individually. You would bless this church as a church, oh God. You brought it here together so that we can grow together. And your word says iron sharpens iron. We need to be together to learn, to grow, even to be a disciple, oh God. We cannot be on our own. We need a community. We need a group. Lord, we pray that you would bless and protect this church. Bless this church and be the salt and light in this community right here and also in their families, in the communities they represent wherever they live, Lord God. We know that you can do it. You've always done it. And Lord, we ask you to do it again eh, through them, through each one of us, Lord. We thank you and we pray, praise you, Lord. We have heard your word and you have said that we want us to go and obey it. And if we did not, it would be useless. Lord, we pray to you, Father, that we don't want it to be useless. We don't want Satan to take it away from us. But we want to have that full experience of your love and grace and mercy in our lives and transformation. That's only possible when we obey. Obedience is so important to see your works, Lord God. And that's the best thing that we could do it. And help us, oh God. Oh Lord, the, you, oh, the Holy Spirit, enable us, empower us, and use us, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. And we ask a blessing for this church. And in the name of Jesus, everybody says, Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Praise the Lord.